And that wouldn't be so bad, except that the Wi-Fi wasn't working in the airport. That's like my worst nightmare, to be trapped somewhere for six and a half hours with no Wi-Fi. All right, but I survived, and fortunately, I had downloaded a bunch of stuff that I needed to, like, to get my lectures prepared, so that was amazingly prepared of me, which is not usually the case. So um, I'm really, really happy to be here. What I, re I want to tell you a little bit about my plan for the week I, um, is I want to transition from, I, I know that Olga did, some, did stuff on hyperbolic and free groups last week. I want to kind of transition us to thinking about non-positively curved groups. That's my plan. So what that's going to mean is today I'm going to summarize a few things that I saw in Olga's lecture that are going to be important for us to carry forward as we think about how to move from negative curvature to non-positive curvature. So, you, so here's my goals. I mean, we'll see if they work, but I always have goals. That's important. Doesn't mean I always get to them, but hopefully we'll see. Um, I want to give two, two ways of, of, of two different classes of non-positively curved groups. And my, my reason for doing it this way is because I kind of want to give you a little bit of a historical perspective on the theory. So we're going to review some stuff about hyperbolic groups and quasi-isometry today. And then um, I will give at least one example of a non-positively curved group today, because that would be really horrible if I didn't, since that's the title of my talks. And then, uh, so the first class I want to discuss is a notion called semi-hyperbolic. I want to do that because it's um, historically that was a class that was introduced right after, sort of right after, whatever that means, the uh, theory of hyperbolic groups. And it was a really cool, like, first attempt at generalizing the theory that when I was a graduate student was, which was a while back, um, was kind of one of the first things I saw. And I thought, wow, that's how you really think about math. Uh, you know, somebody has this really cool idea and you want to generalize it and you see the difficulties that come up. Um, when trying to just do the same thing, but in a slightly more general context. So that's the reason I'm, I want to talk about semi-hyperbolic groups. And then I want to talk about cat zero groups, which is sort of my area of expertise. And again, kind of very example driven. I want some basic properties. I want to um, give you lots and lots of examples of cat zero groups by the end of the week. And then on Friday, I'm going to probably focus in on looking at some techniques and examples that we do all the time with cat zero groups. That's, like I said, that's sort of my main, um, my main area of interest. But I want to present the semi-hyperbolic groups um, just because, I, again, I think historically it's really important to understand how math people think. All right? So if I go too slow or if I go too fast, just let me know. I'm happy to speed up or slow down whatever is necessary. So. Um, I want to start with just, again, I know that Olga did this last week, but sometimes like now there's been like a weekend or something in between. So that means we need to start over a little bit. All right, I'm not going to do a lot of, of, of review, but um, just remembering what Cayley graphs are. All right, so that's going to be our way to think about um, groups as geometric objects, OK? So this is, will be a quick reminder. So G is a group. And S is a subset that does not contain the identity. Um, and we might as well assume that it's symmetric just for ease. We'll see that that's not necessary to do that, but it's just you can always do it, so you might as well. And then we can construct the Cayley graph of G with respect to S. So I think that, that uh, Olga used, put a, because she was typing and not writing on a chalkboard, she did it with a C-A-Y. I'm just going to do it with a C just because I'm writing. All right, this is the Cayley graph of G with respect to S. And again, the vertex set is just the group elements. And then two things are joined by an edge. if you have the following, if there exists an S in S with H equals G S. OK, or you can think about that as that's the same as G inverse H is in S. OK, um, and you, again, I know that Olga did a couple examples, so I, I don't want to redo the standard examples. So what I just want to do is remind you of some key properties that we're going to be using about Cayley graphs. So the first is that if we make 
each edge isometric to the unit interval, then we get, we see that the Cayley graph is a proper, oh, I should have said S is finite. I guess I never said that. Finite generating set. Uh, yes, well, I mean, <laughs> I haven't said this yet. I guess I should say it. Um, if I, I, couldn't do, I can do this construction without saying that S generates. And it turns out that S generates if and only if this graph is connected. All right, so, um, but I want to say it this way. So I, I am going to say it because I, this fact won't be true without it. Okay, this is a proper geodesic metric space. Okay, where you just use the distance between two points is the infimum of lengths of paths, or the minimum of lengths of paths, because a minimum is going to be attained. All right, so that's how we think about groups as geometric objects. And of course, the second thing is, um, actually, I kind of thought that was a cool thing the first time I saw it, that you can do this construction for any subset, and then a geometric way of thinking about the, set, about the, the subset generating is that this graph turns out to be connected. That's a typical way of uh, thinking in geometric group theory, OK? Um, and then G acts on this graph uh, by isometries via left multiplication. OK? And let me just take a, a minute to say, um, one thing about that action that I think it can be confusing at first. So, so first of all, it's easy to see that if, if, if x is a vertex of this graph, remember that just means it's a group element, and I think of g as a group element that's going to be acting on my graph, that some, you might even want to go like this to make it clear that you're thinking of it as some transformation, some symmetry of the graph, then what I mean and of course, we always abuse notation and then just call it G again, just to make life interesting, right? Then G hit X is just left multiplication, like I said. That's what I mean by that. Um, and then you, what you have to think, what you have to do to realize this is an action by isometries is you think about an edge that you already had. So this was an edge in the graph that looks like this. There's some S between them. And when I hit the whole thing by G, what I get, so this is my little isometry here, you want to make sure that you get an edge that looks like this with the same S on it. OK, and you can just see that from the definition, that that's clear that you're going to get that. And then I just want to say one more thing. I'm sure there's some ordering to what I'm doing that makes sense it's in terms of board. Oh, wow, there's just boards everywhere. All right, this is great. OK. And just, again, to remind you that there's a difference between uh, to be like when you think about this element G as a transfer, you want to think of it as a transformation of the graph. So let me just draw one little picture, all right, the standard picture of the free group that you've already seen. This is the free group on two generators. So I've got the identity. I've got the vertex A. I've got the vertex B where these, so I'm looking at the free group on A and B free group on two generators. And what I want to do is we know the following. Let's, let's look at the transformation. Now I'm going to stick with that transformation notation. So what should this mean if I take the product of two elements and I want to look at the transformation determined by the product? OK? So let's think I know for sure that this should take the identity vertex to this vertex. I mean, that's because it's just left multiplication. So that's certainly true. But let's just. Think about it as, as a composition of transformations, OK? So when I first, so what do I really want that to be? I have to be careful. So I'm going to first, in order to be an action, I need something like this, right? I need the transformation determined by the product is the composition of the transformations. And it's a left action, so I need to do B first and then A. So when I do B, let's look what happens to this line, for example. 
When I do the transformation B, this red line, or pink line, uh, so B takes everything sort of in that direction, right? it takes the identity vertex to here, it takes that red line to this red line, right? And then when I do the transformation A to this picture, I'm going to follow this blue line. So A takes me over to this, takes the blue line over to there. So you can see, right, remember, the, so the red line takes, I mean, the, the transformation phi sub B takes that red line to that red line, and in fact takes this little white one to that little red one, right? So it takes that entire subtree up to that entire subtree there. And then, so you see that we get, let me label a couple of these edges too. This is a B. That's a vertex B, and that's an edge labeled A. So that first, the identity that goes there, and then that whole red line gets moved. This whole red line gets moved to here. So in fact, this vertex does get sent to there. But it's not the way you would think, right? Because I read the path AB, but the transformation first takes me there and then takes me there. That's the point I want to make about thinking about an action of a group on its Cayley graph. There's a difference between reading paths and making sure you understand what each element is doing as a symmetry of the graph. Right? That's the point I want to make. Okay? So that can be fun to play around with. All right. Um, all right, and I wanted to say one more thing about this that I meant to put up there, but I'll say it right here. And that is that the action described, the action described is geometric, meaning it's properly discontinuous and co-compact, and of course by isometries. All right, we said each element acts like an isometry of this graph. The quotient is a finite graph, and the, um, and the action is properly discontinuous. There's no accumulation of orbits. Right? The orbit of the identity is just the entire vertex set. So in the quotient, I just get one vertex in the orbit, and I get finitely many edges in the quotient. Okay, So it's compact quotient, properly discontinuous, and I will use that word to describe an action of that type on a metric space. Everybody OK with that? All right. And so just kind of as a summary of a, a bunch of stuff you saw in Olga's lectures, I just want to, I want to say it with a single sentence. And that is um, that every finitely generated group acts geometrically. And if I start abbreviating stuff too much, just let me know on a proper geodesic metric space. All right? Sometimes I just like start dropping vowels left and right for no reason whatsoever. Um, and one of the things that you, you saw in Olga's lecture as well in the Schwarz-Milner theorem is that, in fact, the converse of this is true as well. So you saw that already. I'm just going to say it, though. I'm sure I'm spelling that wrong. I always spell it wrong. It implies the converse is true as well. In other words, if I have a group that acts geometrically on a proper geodesic metric space, then first of all, it's fin then it's finitely generated. That's all I, 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 there's another part to that theorem too, but we'll talk about more later. So just kind of half of that theorem says that if I, I can go the other way, right? All right, so that's sort of my, um, that's sort of my, my little summary of what we need to know about Cayley graphs for now and my viewpoint I want to take about Cayley graphs. And then I just want to give, um, I just want to give just one shout out to finite groups since this will be the only one I give, right? So here's, here's a cool exercise. Um, you, you can do, I didn't put it on the exercise sheet for today, but this is like for when you're in the airport for six hours with no internet. Here's what you could do, all right? So it's actually, this is an exercise in John Meyer's book on, um, I always get it wrong, Graphs, Groups, and Trees is the name of it. I think that was one of the references I put down. And it is to, it is the following. So if you've just had an abstract algebra course, 
how many people have just had one or had one fairly recently, you'll love this. You will absolutely love this. Well, I mean, I think you'll love it, but maybe you won't, but we can give it a try. So think about the group, the symmetric group, okay? And I think that Olga even gave, she gave a Cayley graph for one of the dihedral groups. But I want to look at the symmetric group, which is a little more complicated. And here's the generating set I want to look at. I want to look at the adjacent transpositions. So that, I just mean, everybody understand my notation there? So I just look at that set of transpositions, OK? And it's easy to see that, first of all, that set generates G. It's one of the standard facts you prove anyway about the symmetric group at some point in a homework problem. The exercise is to give a description of, a, of the Cayley graph of G with respect to this set, with this generating set. All right. So describe this graph. Right, it's a finite graph. Just describe it combinatorially somehow. All right. And here's something really cool about it. So this is a cool property. And that is that the graph, well, I just should call it what it is. It's the Cayley graph. This Cayley graph is bipartite. That's something you can prove about it once you are able to describe it. All right, you can prove that it's bipartite. And what that allows you to do, it's easy to see that you can then get a homomorphism, writing the wrong way, from um, the symmetric group to the cyclic group of order two that takes a permutation. And what you do is you, so I'm going to describe it. You start at, remember, the, the, this sigma is some vertex of the Cayley graph. And the way this homomorphism is going to work is it's going to look at, the, look at any path from the identity to sigma, that vertex. And because this graph is bipartite, you can prove that they're all either odd or even. Right? So I just said it. I'm not going to write it. Right? So I'll just say parity of sigma geometric. Parity. In other words, I just told you what it is in English, so I'm not going to then write it on the board because that's too much. All right, But that's how you describe the map. And this is the map that you have to talk about in abstract algebra class. Right? In abstract algebra class, you prove that parity is well defined for all permutations in SN. Right? And this is just a really cool geometric way of proving it, is using the fact that this Cayley graph is bipartite. So my point in, 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 in Singling this out is because even with finite groups, you can see a lot in a particular Cayley graph. If you change generating sets, you don't see this property. right? And it's, sometimes you can see different properties that you might want to see in a Cayley graph. And it's kind of fun to play around with it. When I teach abstract algebra, I introduce Cayley graphs really early and sort of try to think about the algebraic stuff they're proving with some geometric group theory stuff. All right, so that's one of the things is that you can really, because I find students get really disheartened when they go to read the combinatorial proof of this. It's like, all right, that's cool, but like that proof didn't help me out at all, right? OK, so that's a cool exercise. Another thing you saw in Olga's talk is another way to think about the Cayley graph is as a topologist. I'm not going to write this on the board, because I think, she, again, she already said it in her notes. And that is, well, I'll just say the following. If you start with a, um, a finite presentation of G, then you can build the standard two complex, the presentation two complex. So let x equal the presentation two complex, which we're going to talk more about these later in the week. So I'm not going to say that much more other than to repeat what's something that Olga said. If I, if I build the presentation two complex for this pre finite presentation, then you can think about the Cayley graph as just the one skeleton in the universal cover. Right, this is just some cell complex, and then you lift to the universal cover, and you just look at the one skeleton. That is this Cayley graph. All right, so I just wanted us to all be on the same page with that. OK. 
So I hope that wasn't too much of a repeat of anything that was already done. Maybe, should I use these over here or not? Yeah? All right. So what I want to do next is um, revisit the notion of quasi-isometry. Again, I know that Olga uh, introduced them. I just want to remind you of a few things about them. So uh, I'll just quickly put up the definition again. So we have two metric spaces. I hope I use the same constants that she does, but I bet I didn't, would be my guess. Um, and then we take constants, um, then um, the map F from x to y is a kc quasi-isometric embedding means the following. So if I look at the images, actually I used an a and a b in my notes because I didn't want to use x and y because y is in y. Right? If I look at the distance between the images over in y, they can be bounded by these linear functions of, I'm writing this quickly because I know that you've already seen it once. But sometimes it just gets in there a little better if you write it again. All right, so you're comparing the distances of your, your two domain points with the distances of the target points, and you get this linear relationship. All right? And again, if C was 0, then this is just the usual by Lipschitz embedding. And then the, the furthermore is if the uh, distance in y between y and the whole image, right? So if for all y this is bounded by the same c, then this is called a quasi-isometry. In other words, if it's quasi-surjective, I believe. I don't know if, if Olga used that. If, in addition, this is true, then f is a quasi-isometry. OK? So I'm just going to keep that up there. I know you've seen it once, but I'm just going to kind of keep that up there. All right? And the, um, I want to point out, I don't, I'm not sure if Olga said this, but I want to say it this way. Another way to think about it is that you have a quasi-inverse to this map. If you, if you have a quasi-isometric embedding, instead of thinking about this extra quasi-onto, you start with a quasi-isometric embedding. If that has a quasi-inverse, then the original, then both maps are quasi-isometries. Uh, quasi, uh, All right, so that's another way to think about it. Maybe I won't write that down. Well, maybe I will. No, I won't. That's too much writing. OK? So you saw several examples. So, but I want to write down the two most important examples in some sense. And they're kind of the, the general examples. And that is, first of all, that if I start with a group and two different finite generating sets, then, they're, then their Cayley graphs are quasi-isometric. That's, that's an important one, that if for a group G, with finite generating sets, S1 and S2, the Cayley graph of G, and I'm going to use this notation, Cayley is, is I'm going to use the equivalence relation notation. These two Cayley graphs are equivalent under our notion of equivalence for metric spaces. Right? Being quasi-isometric, as metric spaces is an equivalence relation. That would have been like a one-liner I could have said to summarize everything Olga said about them. Is it two metric spaces are called equivalent when there, if and only if there's a quasi-isometry between them? All right. So, and then the second one is that um, is the other half of the Schwarz-Milner theorem, and that is if G acts geometrically. on a proper geodesic metric space x, 
Then the orbit map. So first of all, let me just fix a base point. Then this map. So where I fix a base point, and then I just embed, I look at the whole orbit. Um, and then what I can do is I have now, I, I, I just put the orbit, and that's just a whole bunch of points that are discreetly distributed in the space x. And if I just draw geodesics between the orbit points in an equivariant way, then I get a picture of the Cayley graph inside of x. I'm pretty sure, I'm sure that Olga probably described that as well, that you can start at x0, um, and you, you get a geometric generating set from the action. You get a, a geometric generating set for the group G. And then you can draw geodesics and then hit them around by the whole group to get a nice picture of the Cayley graph. So this gives a quasi-isometry between, and I'll just go like this, G and X. All right, Because now it really doesn't matter which generating set that I use because of number one. So I can just say is quasi-isometric to the space. Okay. The proof of it picks a particular generating set to think about in, this, in the proof. But once I know that I have one Cayley graph that's quasi-isometric to x, they're all quasi-isometric to x. So I can just write it like that without any confusion, because we've already got it in our brain that we're only talking about metric spaces up to quasi-isometry. Is that OK with everybody? All right, great. So for example, the integer lattice in the plane is, is quasi-isometric to the plane. Okay, and I, I think Olga even showed that picture in the notes where you write down the map that does it. You can write down um, just a geometric description of the map that makes the integer lattice quasi-isometric to the plane. Or actually, I guess you can think about it as it's just the inclusion map. And to see the quasi-inverse from the plane back to the lattice, you just sort of puncture the squares, push them out to their little boundary, and send that center point wherever you want. That's how loose and cool quasi-isometries are. Right, that's the quasi-inverse to the inclusion map. Everybody OK with that? All right. And she did my favorite exercise, which is showing that the trees T3 is quasi-isometric to T4. I think that's in your notes, too. That's my favorite. But you did it, so there you have it. <laughs> I don't get to do it because Olga did it. All right. I think now I could erase something. Okay. So Olga, so those are the two most important examples. And like I said, Olga gave some more concrete, specific examples. What I want to do is think about non-examples. Because most of the time in math, in order to figure out what something is, you need to understand what it is not. Right? Actually, I think that works in life as well as in math. Versus what is and what is not. All right? So Let's look at um, some non-examples. Oh, you know what? I have some exercise. Does it matter if I say, I, I guess the exercises are on the exercise sheet. I don't need to write them up on the board in here. So all right. Um, so here's some non-examples. OK. And the first one is sort of example 0. <clears throat> and that is that um, any so finite sets or spaces or groups, whatever you want to say, I'll say spaces or bounded, bounded spaces are not quasi-isometric to unbounded spaces. OK, that's like example 0, all right? That's, so. Finite groups are not quasi-isometric. No finite group is quasi-isometric to an infinite group. That's another way to think about it in terms of groups. All right, so finite groups are not quasi-isometric to infinite groups ever. Right? All right, so that's like example zero. <clears throat> that's one of the things that just comes directly from the definition. Here's one of my another favorite exercise is that the half ray is not quasi-isometric to the line. OK. So I want to say a word or two about this. And then I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to show you. So I'll say a word or two about that. And then I'm actually going to prove or 
outline a proof that this is not quasi-isometric to this. So to showing two things are not quasi-isometric requires some work, different work than showing two things are quasi-isometric. So what we've actually seen is that showing two groups are quasi-isometric. Well, how could I do it? Well, I could try to compare their Cayley graphs. But that can actually be pretty difficult. I mean, if somebody hands you an infinite group and says, even if somebody hands you a finite group and says, describe its Cayley graph, well, that's not that easy, right? So actually staring at two Cayley graphs and trying to figure out if they're quasi-isometric is a pretty hard problem. But what, this, what these two things tell you, or more importantly, the second one, is it says if I want to see two groups are quasi-isometric, I want to make them both act on the same space or on quasi-isometric spaces. And then I can get that the two groups are quasi-isometric because the two spaces are. That's the whole point of kind of using the geometry of the nice continuous space to think about the groups. Okay? But showing two things are not quasi-isometric is a, is a completely different way of thinking. All right, this one, I'll, I'll, I want to just say a word about this one, and then I'll say a little bit more detail about that one. All right, so for the first one, the way you, so remember, quasi isometries are not continuous, right? They're just like these crazy maps. I can like puncture disks and spread them out and do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. There's no, there's no continuity assumption with a quasi isometry. But oftentimes, you can think about what the right way, what, like what if it were continuous? Can I use the machinery of continuous functions to help me kind of fix up a proof where I just have a bunch of constants running around. And that's generally the way to think. So for example, for this one, for, for number one, suppose I had a quasi-isometry from R, suppose F is a quasi-isometry. All right? Now if I, so let me just draw a picture. This is supposed to be an idea. You can fill in the, you can fill in the details of this um, to really, really, make you understand what quasi-isometry means. So here's the picture you should think of in your mind. And let's just suppose on top of it that it was continuous for a second. Then it would mean, so here's my r direction, and here's my ray direction. And you know, phi, so this map f sends, I actually, I think I called it phi in my notes. I'm going to keep saying phi, so I might as well. So, phi map zero somewhere on that line, right? And then if this were continuous, I'd get some curve. Right? I'm not going to say that yet. But what I am going to say is what do I get from the fact that it's a quasi-isometry is I get that the limit as t goes to infinity has to be infinity, right? That the further I go out along here, the higher the images must be, just because really because of number zero. Right? That thing's unbounded, so its image has to be unbounded. That's what that says. And the limit as t goes to minus infinity must also be infinity. Right? Again, same thing over here, that if this is unbounded, it has to go to something unbounded. All right? And the other thing is, is this. So that if I take, let me just even give some constants there, k, c, if I take two consecutive integers, say, right? So if I take two consecutive integers along here, the map takes an interval of length 1 to something that's no longer than k plus c. Right? I'm just really using the, the right side of the inequality, right? To just say that that's true. So you can think about marching out along interval, you know, marching out along the integers and seeing where the images go and just draw that discrete set, right? You could just do that. And what you know is that has to march out, like, at that pace. Now, if this were a continuous map, what is the first thing you think of from calculus class when you see these two things? So I'll just draw a little picture. There. It's not a parabola, but that's a decent enough picture. So. Or a parabola or something like that, right? So, what if I were to draw a horizontal line here? Now, what do you think of? Intermediate value theorem. Beat it into the heads of calculus students that don't want to hear it. Intermediate value theorem. And they go, what does that mean again? What's that whole like, there exists, blah, 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 right? But that's, what, that's exactly what you should think of when you see this picture. What it means is that at any height that I want to choose here, if I pick any height, no matter how high it is, 
I'm going to be able to find points on either side. Right? I'm going to have to be, if it was truly honestly continuous, then I can apply the intermediate value theorem to this. So when I say big, I mean much bigger than phi of 0. So pick any height that's bigger than phi of 0 and do the intermediate value theorem to each side. So there's a continuous map. I would, be, I would have to be able to find somebody over here that honest to goodness maps to exactly the same spot. And the same thing over here. It might be some other Q that maps exactly to A, if it was honest to goodness continuous. But that's OK if it's not honest to goodness continuous. I can still do like a quasi version of the intermediate value theorem. I know that for any A, I can find a little, I can basically do this up to a constant. Because remember, these march out at this pace. So I can always find one that's close to A, like within that much of A. And this one too. They don't have to be symmetrically across the origin, but I just drew them that way. And then once you get that, you can see that this is a really, really long interval, but yet it's getting mapped into a tiny interval, right? Because phi of p and phi of q are really, really close. And this had nothing to do with where I chose a. As long as it's bigger than phi of 0, then I can always find points that are really far out that get mapped into a tiny, right? Here's like phi of p might be here instead of exactly on a, and phi of q might be here. Not exactly on A, but that's still really small. It's like no more than two times that constant, for example. All right? And then, but you know that can't happen. That violates like everything in our brain about quasi isometries. And when I say that, I mean you can actually write down a little proof with K's and C's and D's and every other constant you want to choose that nothing depends on where I chose that height as long as it's bigger than A. Okay? So that's a typical kind of proof showing something is two things are not quasi-isometric, is that you actually think about it if it were continuous, and then you get to use like all of your thoughts about con continuous functions, and then just mess it up a little with constants. OK, so that's a great exercise to work through in all of its glory. All right, let me erase this one. And I'm going to do the second one. Let me look at time. I have 20 minutes. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't do the second one given time. I always talk slower than I probably should, but I talk a lot. I talk at a quick rate, really loudly, but it's still slow overall progress. It's like my derivative is less than or equal to 1. Yeah. All right. So maybe I will. I do love the second proof. Should I do it? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. I love crowd participation when people say, do it, do it, do it. Go, go, go. All right, so we'll do number two. All right, so um, here's the first thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suppose I have a quasi-isometry again. And this time, did I call it f? Nope, I called it phi. Um, oh, I know why I called it phi here. So let's again suppose I have one. So I have some quasi-isometry. And I want to recall, again, another fact that probably it might be a little less familiar than the intermediate value theorem, but it's still a fact you've probably seen before. And that is this fact, is that any continuous function f from uh, the circle to the line maps an antipodal pair to the same place. So given any. There exists an x in S1 with f of x is equal to f of minus x. So I mean the antipodal points, right? In fact, that, pr that proof can be, that fact can be proven in this, in, you know, in this dimension with the intermediate value theorem, OK? So you can actually prove that any odd function from S1 to R that's continuous has a 0. That's the intermediate value theorem. And then you can simply make an odd function from f. Right? f of x equals, or yeah, g of x equals f of x minus f minus x, or something like that. And you can make an odd function. So you can prove this with the intermediate value theorem. So nothing beyond calculus used here so far to even get that. OK, this can be proved. That's actually nice to think about using. IVT. 
And for those of you who've had a little bit of topology, you actually know that there's a, there's a, a higher dimensional analog of this, the Borsak-Ulam theorem. But I'm just using it in this one dimension that, in case you haven't heard of that theorem. OK? Um, then what, so what I want to do is I want to, again, I want to use that even though this map not, might not be continuous. I'm going to start with a quasi-isometry, and what I'm actually going to do is replace it with a continuous map. And here's the way that goes. So what I do is I'm going to choose, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go like this. So I'm going to draw a picture of a circle, which I'm really good at if I use dotted lines. Isn't that pretty good? I think I'm pretty awesome at drawing circles on the chalkboard. It only took me like 20 years. But it's the whole, like doing it dotted like that, you almost can't mess it up. All right, so there's my circle. And then you draw the axes. That's the other key. You don't draw the axes first. That never works. So what I want to do is I want to take, um, so fix an end. Right, and it's going to eventually be really large. So it's going to be greater than something. And we can figure that out later. And what I want to do is I want to take 2n equally spaced points on the circle of radius n centered at the origin. So then n appears a couple times there. Right? So I fix a circle of really big radius. And then what I do is, so here maybe this is x naught, and then I got some points over here. Here's an xi. And what I want is that this over here is xi plus n. Right? Those are antipodal points. That's the way I'm choosing it. OK? And what I know is that if I take two consecutive points, so let me, let me go like this. Well. I don't know where it's going to be. Let's put it here, xi plus 1. The, diff the length here of this arc, so this arc right here, that's not a very good color. Let's do that arc. There we go. So the distance between two points here, again, I'm working in R2, is less than or equal to pi. Right, because it's less than or equal to the arc length distance between them. So it's less than or equal to pi. That's why I chose 2n of the points. So the arc length is pi, so their distance is less than pi. Could even put a less than, but that's OK. We don't need the, to do that. Which means that if I apply the map and, and look at their distances, then that's less than or equal to some constant. Right, it's like k pi plus c. Right, k pi plus c, if they had the k and the c. OK. So now what do we do? So what we're going to do is um, we're going to replace this with a continuous map. What I want to do is I want to define a continuous map, f from the circle to R, and I want it to agree with phi on these endpoints, two endpoints. So I want f of xi to be the same. And all I'm going to do to make it continuous is for these little arcs in between, I'm just going to send that arc to the interval between the image points. It's bounded, so this is a totally OK thing to do. That's what's going to make it continuous. Each one of those goes to a little bounded piece. And so, um, and then just extend to the arcs between. All right, and it's key that that's bounded to make this a continuous map. And now, what you get is you get to use the you get to use the result. So there is a pair of points, a pair of antipodal points. So maybe it's like here's that one and here's the other one. You know, x i plus one plus n. There's the other little red arc that's across from it. And there's some blue point that gets mapped to its antipodal point. Right? All right, so there exists an x in S1 such that f of x is equal to f of minus x. OK? And then again, now what you know, so now you just look at these. You know these two, so I've just, I know it lies, it could be one of the vertices, and that'd be great, or not, but I know that it's pi close to a vertex, and its antipodal point is pi close to the antipodal point of the other guy. 
right, of the, of the vertex or of my chosen points. So from that, so again, you know that the distance between x and xi, say, is less than pi, and the distance between minus x and minus xi, or xi plus n, if you want, is less than pi. You know that, OK, less than or equal to. But what this forces, this forces that I want to make sure I get my inequalities right, because I hate when I mess up inequalities in public. Um, that is that you get, you can actually use a triangle inequality. So remember, phi was my original quasi-isometry, which is just now the same as f of xi, because I did it the same on vertices. And that's less than or equal to, uh, oh no, wait. This is actually, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. Yes. No. OK, this is less than or equal to whatever this, this I call d in my notes. I call that constant d. This is less than or equal to 2d, because we know that things that are less than pi. So I've just used the triangle inequality there. I've said first go to phi of x, then go from minus x to there. Just did a triangle inequality that gets you this far. It's only because I'm running out of board space, right? And then you're going to use the other side of the quasi-isometry interval. The, the other side of the quasi-isometry um, inequality says that the distance between xi and its opposite, or in other words, x, this, right, this is the other side of it. I know you're not going to remember all these or even write them down, but as long as you're getting the gist of it and somebody's copying quickly right, and neatly, then you can move the constants to the other side. And what you get is that 2 times the norm, the regular old Euclidean norm of xi, the length of it, is bounded. Independent of n, the constants are the d's and the k's and the c's, right? Because this is a d. This is basically a d. You add the c, so I could even say what it is. So that if you're trying to recreate this, then it looks like that, OK? But of course, if I just choose n larger than that, then that's going to be a contradiction. This is important that it's independent of n. All right, so that's a typical, again, showing two things are not quasi-isometric is tough. And one of the exercises I left, since Olga stole my favorite one of t3 is quasi-isometric to t4, is to show that t3 is not quasi-isometric to the real line. Right? Again, the not quasi-isometric thing is, hard, is different. I'm not saying it's harder, it's just different. All right. OK, and then of course, like I said, there's actually a higher dimensional version of this theorem, the Borsa, this borsa coulomb theorem. And you can show that if you had a quasi-isometry from Rm to Rn, then m would have to be less than or equal to n. You can, in other words, you can use the same kind of idea to prove that two Euclidean spaces can only be quasi-isometric if they're of the same dimension. Okay. All right, so that's enough about um, the, that stuff right now. But I think those are cool exercises to really get you to understand the kinds of things that are preserved under quasi-isometry and the kinds of things that are not. All right, so as we make, and part of the reason I'm doing this is as we make our transition from hyperbolicity to non-positive curvature, we're going to see that quasi-isometry is tricky, all right? But it, so you really need to understand what it can and cannot do before you move from hyperbolicity to non-positive curvature. That's the kind of take away from that. So and again, let me just recall what a quasi-geodesic is. So now I'm going to start the move of, or I'm going to recall some things about hyperbolicity that we have to think about before we can move away from that world. So a KC quasi-geodesic in X, again, X is always going to be a proper geodesic metric space forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? Did you get that? That was like four forevers, forever and ever and ever and ever. So this is quasi-geodesic if, um, uh, a, oh, is, is the image of, you can think about it this way, is the image of a quasi 
isometrically embedding, quasi-isometric embedding of the form, I take an interval into x. So you can think of it as the map itself or the image of the map. All right. So the picture, you know, you might have the beginning of this and the end of this. That this is your phi of a and your phi, sorry, gamma of b. That's your two endpoints. And the image is some path that looks like that, although it doesn't have to be continuous. Right? I'm drawing it like it's continuous, but it turns out that there's an important lemma that says I can take a quasi a quasi geodesic, right? I can take a quasi geodesic, I can mark off some, I can look at some image points in here, like maybe some discrete set, like intersect it with Z. I can take some discrete points and then I can join them by geodesics and I'll still have a quasi geodesic. That's why it's kind of okay for me to draw it like that, or maybe, maybe draw it more like this. Maybe that's a better way of thinking about it. I said a lot in that sentence, but that's a technical lemma, that I can start with a quasi-isometry and pick some nice points. So what I mean by nice is that they kind of march out regularly from beginning to end, so that this, these jumps that I'm making are bounded by some constant d that depends on k and c. And then I can join them by geodesics, and that, that's OK. So when you think about quasi-geodesics in a geodesic metric space, you might as well think about them like this. And then still think of the inequalities that you have to think of. But because you chose these equally spaced vertices all along there, then the, edge, the, the, the points along the edges are OK. They still satisfy the, the same quasi-isometry constants that the original embedding did. That's the point. OK? OK. So what I want to do is I wanted to keep that up. I'm going to go here. Oh, I guess, I, well, this is fine. All right, my algorithm for board use is lost. So what I want to do is highlight the single most important property um, of hyperbolic spaces that is not going to work later. All right? So actually, I've just realized that everything I've said today is kind of negative. No quasi-isometries things that aren't going to work. I'm being very negative, but I promise I'll be positive later, uh, like tomorrow. Maybe not today. I'm still negative. I am still non-positive. Excellent, excellent pun. I was just thinking of it as you said it. I was like, oh my gosh, I just said negative. I should be saying non-positive. All right. So here's the single most important fact. about hyperbolicity that is going to fail for us, all right? But I wanted to point it out specifically um, because I didn't see a statement of it in, in Olga's notes, but I'm sure it was there for the taking. So here's the statement, is that for all delta, I'm getting this statement actually out of Brideson and Hefliger. So when I start with these constants, there exists an R that depends on all three of these. Such that the following holds. Okay. So if X is a delta hyperbolic space, right? So use the word this is for hyperbolicity, and gamma is a KC quasi isometry, a uh, quasi geodesic, sorry, quasi geodesic in X um, from P to Q. So it's blah, 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 blah from P to Q with, I'm going to draw, I'm going to say this, with this any geodesic from P to Q in X. Because right, remember, this is a geodesic metric space. There could be more than one geodesic between P and Q, but we know there's at least one. All right. Uh, then here's the R. Here's where it comes in. Then the Hausdorff distance. Now, 
between the image of the map, so image of gamma, and this geodesic is less than or equal to r. All right. So I sort of started to draw this picture over here. You can think about it here. There's, the, there's an actual geodesic, that blue. And if I just sort of take the R neighborhood, both are contained in it. I can take the R neighborhood of the blue and capture the white, or I can take the R neighborhood of the white and capture the blue. Everybody OK with that? I think you, you've seen Hausdorff distance. That's the best way to think about it is look at the R neighborhood of one. It con contains the other. All right. All right, so, one of the, so why is that the single most important property of hyperbolic spaces? Well, because it's powerful. All right, so two, uh, two immediate consequences of that, or so two big consequences. A lot, I mean, there's lots of them. In fact, almost every proof that you do about hyperbolic groups, this is lurking around somewhere in the background. But I'm just going to point out two of the big consequences. One of them is that um, delta hyperbolicity is preserved under quasi-isometry with a possibly different delta. Right? Your delta changes, but the fact that your triangles are delta thin does not change. Right? So delta may change, will change probably, but may change. Thin triangles, if I have so if I have two spaces and they're quasi-isometric, and I have thin triangles in one, so that means geodesic triangles are thin, I can map them over to the other space. Right, so I'll just draw the picture as I'm saying it. I start with a geodesic triangle in one of the spaces, say x, and then I can think about it over in y. I get, qua I get some sort of quasi-geodesic triangle over here. Right? And if this, were, if this is delta hyperbolic, then I can draw the geodesic triangles, I can draw any geodesic triangle between those three points. I, if I know this one's delta thin, then I have these, this r constant right here. Then I can carry that back to the other, and I will get some other delta prime. OK? That's the standard proof of that, and it's pretty important, right? Because it, it's a group theoretic thing. It's that if I have a hyperbolic group, then anybody who's quasi-isometric to it will also be a hyperbolic group. All right? That's one of our hugest issues we have to face when we're do, going to non-positive curvature. And then the very last thing I will say, um, because I see that I'm going to be running out of time in two minutes, and I don't want to do that, um, is because that's like the fatal sin running over your very first lecture then nobody ever wants to come back. Um, oh, this I didn't put in my notes, but I wanted to say it for those of you who know about it. It also allows you to show, it doesn't matter what this means for those of you who don't, allows you to prove that um, a QI between hyperbolic groups or spaces extends to a homeomorphism of their boundaries. Again, if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. Maybe by the end of the week you might, but it doesn't matter if you know it today. That was just for people that know what that means. Right? You could not prove this theorem without stability of quasi-geodesics. All right. I was going to use a proof. Well, I can, I can start the day with this one tomorrow. Actually, I'll start the day with that one tomorrow. Example. One example. I'm just going to say it in my last like 10 seconds. Here's an example. I can? All right. All right, so here's my example. So what do I mean by an example? I mean an example of a group that's non-positively curved but not negatively curved. Well, there's one trivial one, and that's z plus z. You've already seen that one. All right, so, so that's example zero. Is That's no fun, z plus z. All right. So that group is definitely not negatively curved, but it is going to be non-positively curved. All right? So that's going to be one of our examples. And let me just say a word about this, is that you might have already seen this yesterday, but if not, you're going to see it for sure tomorrow, is that when you have delta hyperbolicity, you cannot have arbitrarily wide flat strips in your space. 
right? And therefore, you can't have a whole plane in your space. You'll definitely believe that and like into your heart and soul and the core of your being by the end of the week, you will totally feel that. You will never, ever forget it, right? All right, so for sure, that's gonna be one. And then a really cool way to build other examples that doesn't work with hyperbolicity is to take products, right? Taking metric products ruins hyperbolicity, but is good for non-positive curvature. So.